You, there's a great uh, a great saying. I'm trying to remember who uh, who it's from, but basically what they said was um, silence always favors the oppressor, not the oppressed. Absolutely. So so whenever you fail to speak and fail to uh, stand by your principles, you're you're always favoring the oppressor. And and in you know in most cases now in modern society, you look at you know just things like surveys on what what percentage of this of society is actually really woke it's actually quite low but the problem is that most people who don't really buy into that are so quiet that they allow the tail to wag the dog you know if people would speak out even even if 10 percent of people who held an opinion would be willing to speak out it would be enough to Hey, thanks for stopping by Minnesota Black Robe Regiment. As always, make sure you are subscribed down there. There's a couple of different options for subscription. You can do it right here in the video, the little white icon in the bottom of the screen, or down below near the description, you can hit subscribe. Make sure you're checking out the bell icon so you get notifications because, well, as everybody knows, YouTube likes to uh, shadow ban people and uh, secretly unsubscribe people and even changes their uh, bell icon notification those settings for them without them knowing last few weeks i've had so many people go i sub to your channel and I, I i'm not getting notifications and they're like double check and they're like did you kick me off your channel i said no that wasn't me coffee if those of you who aren't who've been paying attention don't know and if you haven't been paying attention that's not my problem that's yours uh coffee got to check it out it's really good it's the best stuff you'll ever have if you ever had black rifle you won't drink black rifle especially after they went semi-woke on us I also got uh, some good stuff to go with it. Some really good Patriot friends who are making these for me. I mean, I'm paying them for it. But but yeah, and if you're one of those people who doesn't like to drink coffee at night, you can always have an adult beverage. Don't drink the gray thing in there, by the way. And look at the, the link down below for SibShield. George would like to help you protect your phone or protect you from your phone listening in when you don't want it to listen to you and protect it from... EMPs, which the way the world's going right now, an EMP is a very high likelihood. I don't know if anybody's paying attention to the the Russo-Ukrainian situation, but uh, there's all sorts of saber rattling when it comes to uh, nuclear weapons. And of course, our esteemed president has said that he's not afraid to do what he needs to do. Now, I bring up our president because I'm going to introduce you to our guest here in just a second. His name is Chris. He's a doc doctor like md type doctor not not a philosopher he's got something practical to do with his life he is a doctor in canada well he's still a doctor in canada we're gonna find out how how long that'll last year at, once he starts telling us his story but as many of you know um our president reached out to his president and told his president that if he were the president he'd crack down on the freedom convoy and sure enough Justin Trudeau Castro said, yeah, we're going to shut down these dissident truckers in their, in their dangerous terroristic ways. And uh, then he got his rear end handed to him by, by their legislature and they took away his emergency powers act stuff. So Chris is going to come on. He's going to tell us a little bit about himself. He's going to tell us what he does and why he does it. And uh, he's also going to speak for his wife because she's writer, not a chatter. I have a funny feeling that she's, She's probably almost as entertaining as he is, though. And I just want you to know, when you hear his voice, the similarity is not by plan. Let's see if we can get him in here. Chris, thanks for coming on. I appreciate you being here today. I, I, know, I know that you are under the gun being, as you've told me now a couple of times, the only doctor for quite a ways, which is, has worked to your benefit, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right, um... I've, I've gotten myself into trouble with my uh, loud mouthery. Um, I tend to say what I think for better and for worse over the years. And uh, I've been, I, I'm sort of, a, I, I guess you'd say I'm infamous or notorious for that. Uh, I'm a loved or hated figure. I'm kind of polarizing like, uh, like Jordan Peterson in Canada. If you talk to uh, somebody on the left, he's uh, the devil. And, if you talk to somebody like me, I think he's wonderful. And I got a bit of that reputation here in Nova Scotia over the last few years. So I'm 
kind of down the same path. I, I, I sort of wear, wear that as a badge of honor. You know, you told me before we started recording, you told me about somebody who did a mashup of, of you and Jordan Peace Peterson morphing into each other. And you're going to have to make sure you send me that link so I can put it in the video description. Yeah, I think I think I can find it. Yeah, somebody did. A, it was a Jordan Peterson's face and then it kind of transformed by four panels later. It was my face. So I, 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 it was my proudest moment. <laughs> Never mind all your medical accomplishments. Oh, no. Hell, it's good time, yeah. <laughs> so you you are uh, an MD. You are a practicing physician. What are, are do you have a specialty? Or are you an internist, a generalist, or uh, no? Our, our system's similar to the U.S. We're a little a little different. But I so I, I did my I did undergrad. Uh, I have a background in hard sciences. I was kind of going down the road of doing uh, physics. I did a, a master's in um, it was called health and radiation physics. We kind of parry nuclear physics masters. Realized I was far stupider than everybody else who was in those programs, and I switched into medicine. And so then I did after six years of school, I did four years of undergrad med, and then then we do I did two years of family med training plus an extra year of emerge. So I'm a, a family emerge doc, more or less. And and you live in a, a, a not so densely populated area. Well, well, so there's where I live and, and where I work these days. I I, I kind of have a few. I have a few different jobs. I won't or the audience with all that, but um, I live in a place called Sydney, Nova Scotia, at, with uh, Sydney with a Y, with a Y on, in the middle of the Y on the end. Uh, so, so just like Sydney, Australia, but I always joke, we're the original Sydney. We were, uh, I think it was uh, 1787, we were incorporated a year before Sydney, Australia. And, and you weren't a penal colony. We were not not officially, but we were all the, uh, we were all the British Isles refuse that came over and. Uh, settled in, in which America. is pretty much everything in the colonies yeah pretty much yeah we were we were, we were this largely the scottish refuse where where uh, i live so sydney sydney is about uh, the, the area is about say 100 hundred thousand where i live but where i work is about three hours away and it's, it's uh very very much on the, the very 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 eastern tip of north america it's about as far as you can drive east without driving into the water if you head into the water, the, the next stop would be go due east to be um, La Rochelle, France, give or take. And uh, uh, so I'm way, way, way out here on the eastern uh, tip of, uh, of North America. And in the little tiny place. So where I work, I cover a week at a time in this little uh, place that has about 2,000 people spread over a fairly big rural area. And so I'm, I work in a little tiny hospital. I'm on call. My phone could go and theoretically there could be a an emergency, but just given the low population, we don't have all that many. So uh, hopefully that will. Well, and, and because you're a doctor, then you just hop in your personal helicopter. Yeah, that's right. Actually, actually, what I do is I run across the street, the hot, the little hospitals right across the street, and uh, we do have a helicopter pad. I'm actually looking out the window at the helicopter pad where if we have a real emergency, we call Life Flight, and, and they're here in half an hour and take our patients out. All right. Are you doing this from your office in the hospital? Uh, office in we have uh, so I work nine to five more or less Monday to Friday. I'm in in the in this family practice which is private. That's a story in itself. Canada is very 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 socialist medical system. Hospitals are all publicly run and funded, yep. and, and then there's a kind of a private ish side. So I work. This is a private ish clinic. Uh, and I work here, but the hospital just across the street, and that's where I work. Like when I see emergency patients, I have inpatients. There's a nursing home I look after, so that's it's all part of part of my job. When I'm here. Let's let's actually, because I, I, I think this is a really important part of your story and, and your wife's story. What's your wife's name again for everybody? Uh, Ju Julie, and she's Julie. Kerwin. I'm Melbourne. She's Kerwin. Yeah. So different last name. She's she's a writer. She just published a book. She did. She, if anybody wants to look up her book, uh, it's called. Um, uh, oh my God, she's going to kill me if I forget. But it's a uh, uh, the, the the appendage formerly known as my left arm, and she's been a psychiatrist for well, pushing tw about twenty years, I guess. And uh, so there's a if you read if you read the book, there's a, a reason for that name. It's a very strange name. She's got a quirky sense of humor. The stories are mostly have a uh, the connection to psychiatry and uh yeah it's a, it's a good book i think it's a good read but i'm biased of course yeah well yeah i don't know why because yeah. because you need to be 
yeah. if you know what's good for you. So, right. um, so let's talk a little bit because there again, I think it's important to both your story and to Julie's Julie. Yes. Um, to your guys' story because of where you find yourselves right now, mm. a lot of it has to, has to do with the, the single payer health system, the, the, the socialist Marxist mm. form of healthcare in Canada, mm. because the, the American mindset is even from people who would consider themselves more traditionalist, more conservative, man, it'd be so much easier if we had a Canadian healthcare system. It'd be so much easier if we had a, a, an English form of healthcare. And I'm like, try talking to the Canadians because they will tell you there are a lot of times and a lot of ways where they wish they had the, had the medical freedom, um, to, to do what Americans can do, which is pretty much drive wherever they want and get healthcare. Yeah. What's the Canadian system set up like? And, and why is it, why would it be important for people to understand that like, you're the doc, the doctor for a particular town? Because that, that, that mindset went away a long time ago in the United States when, you know, you had the, the village doctor and it wasn't because the government said so it was, that was just, the only guy who was crazy enough to ride his horse and his buggy that far west. Yeah, but man, Canadian versus American healthcare system, huge. Uh, how do, how do I kind of do a brief intro to that? Because it's such a big um, issue. So Canada, Canada, and the U.S. basically had the same type of healthcare system probably up until the 1960s, right? You uh, you paid the doc. The doc would charge for services if you went in. You had to pay for it. Um, and you know, people who were destitute or whatever, a lot of docs did uh, part of their work. They did charity work, or in small places, they you know, if somebody couldn't afford it, they'd take a dozen eggs or whatever, you know. But it, the barter system, right? It was it was a free market system, right? A doc didn't have to see somebody who couldn't pay, but in general, they did. And there were a lot of charities, church charities, and whatnot, who would pay for people who were down on their luck. The government started to cover some healthcare costs uh, for, you know, for, for poor people at some point in history in both countries, you know, you guys have Medicaid, Medicare, uh, but we went full kind of social system in the late 60s, early 70s. Healthcare is weird in, in Canada, it's provincial. Um, it's, it's one of the few things that in our constitution, it's, uh, that each province is given the powers to regulate their own health care. So uh, it wasn't like a, a monolithic thing where it happened in Canada all at once, but once one province went, then another, another, another. Um, and basically what it did was the government, uh, the government funds health care for everyone. So when you are born, you get a health care card that covers all your health care expenses and you have that until you die. It has a number on it. And there are real advantages to that, I will say. I don't have to worry when I see somebody in my office, I don't have to worry, are they gonna pay me? Who's gonna pay me? Which insurance system, which form do I have to fill out all that? I, what I do is I, I have a, an office up in Sydney where I do work when I'm not here in this little uh, village of Canso. And uh, I actually do my own billing. I just, all I need is their healthcare number, their date of birth, their name, what I saw them for. I fill in a spreadsheet, I email that off every couple of weeks and I get, I get paid so it's really advantageous in that they did so the big advantage our healthcare system has over yours is that something like i, I think I've, I've read that somewhere from 20 30 percent of your system uh, is is about collecting insurance data and secretaries and systems to collect all that because it's very complicated it's it it, it takes quite frankly i mean you walk into an office and it's like, who's your insurance? Who's your insurance provider from, you know, who's your employer? Do you have employer insurance? Who's, you know, what's the provider? Do you have your insurance card? Can we get, you know, and it's filling out the same information over and over and over again. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's, it's mind numbingly boring mm -hmm. when it comes to going in for an appointment. But, you know, the experience we recently had a, a loved one here in, in my family, uh, extended family that we had to take to the emergency room room they took him in an ambulance and i followed up and this loved one is literally in pain can barely move and one of the first people that she talks to is 
is the the insurance person who has to come into the room while they're trying to administer medications and, and figure out what's mm -hmm. wrong with her hounding her about insurance and i'm like is it and i finally was like is it now the right time for this can <laughs> like mm -hmm. she's mm -hmm. in the emergency department in a triage room you think there might you you might be able to talk to her once things have settled down so i think that's one of the reasons why people seem so i think foolishly enamored with the system in canada because they feel like they could just walk into wherever they want at any given time and just get health care and not have to answer any questions and it's just all taken care of yeah. but it's so it's easy on a business from the business end for someone like you but it's not as as cut and dried and as simple as americans would like to think it is no so there's there's this that's the upside right then there's always trade-offs and like like you know thomas soul said there's no solutions only trade-offs and the trade-off that we make is because of the person who pays, you know, pay the pay the piper. You, you name the tune, right? You call the tune, and uh, so the government r runs our healthcare system too. So that's this. That's the problem with our system is that pretty much everything is government run, um, and and not only that, our, the Canada Healthcare Act actually forbids a lot of uh, private options it's expressly forbidden it's not just not built into the system but it's actually forbidden so you can you know if people are interested in reading about it, there's lots of places that can but there's actually been doctors who tried to set up privately run clinics in canada that would be very popular and people would want to go to but they in many cases being shut down so uh, I've, I've read i don't know if it's true but I, I think there's some truth to it that we have the most socialized system in the world besides north korea right and so what's the confusion I think that both Canadians and Americans have, and just to bring it to a fine point, is there's a difference between uh, publicly funded healthcare and publicly publicly run healthcare. Those are closely related, and in Canada they kind of came as a package, but they're not necessarily inextricably tied to each other. So the most highly functioning healthcare systems in the world. Um, like your, your, your healthcare system is actually pretty high privately, uh, sorry, highly functioning, but it, it's the most expensive in the world and a, a very unwieldy in a few ways. Our system is, uh, not as expensive as yours, but it sucks. And then you have European systems, which are publicly funded, but privately run. So the, yes, the government will pay for your healthcare, but as physicians, uh, you know, in, in Switzerland or something, you have huge latitude in, in where you work and how you provide those services and yep. how you set up and hire and fire your support staff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the free market can uh, kind of compete to pr provide the best care and patients can choose which where they want to get their care. Um, so what happens in Canada, because everything is uh, publicly run is, you know, it's, as, it's just as well run as your local DMV, right? Um, so you go, you go into an emergency. That, that was all you needed to say for my American audience. <laughs> they yeah. hate the DMV. So, so you know, I, 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 again, I don't want to bore the audience too much with all the details, but I'll give you one sort of trend. They watched me, they're used to being bored. <laughs> I, I'll give you sort of one trend line, one story. So what's happened over the years as healthcare has gotten more technical, more expensive, and harder for the government to pr provide full healthcare to everyone, more and more expensive, our budgets are, stri are strapped, and some things get funded better than others. <clears throat> and what's happened in Canada is family physicians have gotten very poorly funded. So more and, and and we're very short of doctors we don't graduate many doctors so as doctors graduate they tend to gravitate towards places where they're better paid i.e not family practice mm -hmm. um in in canada you can't book directly with a specialist a specialist can't get paid to see you unless you're you have a referral so most of our health care is done by family docs and you really need one to access any health care but as we've had fewer and fewer and fewer, for instance, in my province, somewhere 
um, the, the official numbers and the real numbers are different, but probably around 20% of people don't have a family doctor now. So to access primary care, they, they often have to walk into waiting, or sorry, to emergency rooms. And, and the wait times in many emergency rooms, if you go in with a low acuity problem, you might sit for four hours, six hours, and in some extreme cases, 12 hours, 14 hours, 24 hours happen sometimes. And that's to, that's to access primary care. There, there are no options for that if you want to, um, if you want to get care. And what, so what's happened is the emergency rooms got busier and busier and busier. And so the government responded to sort of public pressure by putting more, pouring money, more money into the emergency rooms. But the problem wasn't that the emergency rooms, it was that there's no family doctors. So in typical government fashion, it, I always compare it to, it's like you got the, uh, the, the four-legged stool, one's a little short, so you shorten up another one, then it's still wrong, and then shorten up another one, you just keep going around, around, around so your school, stool is finally sitting on the floor. And this is what they keep doing, they keep funding one part at the detriment of another, and then that's not working, so they do it again, and the, everything just gets more and more out of balance. And that's just sort of typical, because you know we have governments on four-year election cycles, they're responding to acute stressors and they're not looking at a long-term plan it's just so rather than the free market trying to come up with solutions and give people the best care just a, a shit show of uh, government incompetence so let me i'm gonna there again I, i'm a i have studied this but obviously i'm not an expert but for lack of better terminology sometimes to get a family care doctor or a primary care doctor or a family whatever it's almost a lottery system correct you have to basically enter your name into a lottery and and then kind of hope and, and pray that an opening comes along either somebody moves or dies yeah there's a it's it's different in different areas of canada so in some areas of canada if you live in toronto there's probably lots of options for for care uh in many of the big cities because a lot of docs you know they're kind of um they're the kind of people who want to live in cities they like they have lots of money they like nice restaurants and nice things and all that and they tend to not want to be in rural areas so rural areas of canada struggle a lot more to get physicians uh it's uh it's not all government run so as a family doctor i can to some extent choose who i'm going to pick on in my practice so somebody might call up and say my cousin ernie just moved to town and he's got cancer and would you look after him and i can either say sure or i could say look my practice is far too busy and i just can't do it but the government again has put its tendrils into this one and here in nova scotia and other provinces now they have a um, a wait list so you call the centralized government number and you say i don't have a family doctor and this is my address and they put you on the list and there's we're a province of almost exactly a million people and we have uh, I think I read that there was 87,000 people on the list. And that's just the people who have bothered to call and put themselves on the list. Like my wife and I don't have a family doctor. We just, we just know that there's 87,000 people on the list, so we didn't bother, and I know many people. So the guess is it's probably at least twice that, maybe more. So maybe 20% of the population doesn't have one. They can go on the list and maybe when the doctor moves their area, they might get a, they might get a doctor, but it might, might be 10 years before they do, right? I just, I just want to quote... Phys physician heal thyself that's what <laughs> you're kind of in that position right now where it's, you're literally like if you unless it's acute or emergent you you probably do have to do a lot of your own care i would imagine um or is that forbidden you're not allowed to oh, see yourself oh, i see what you're saying yeah <laughs> Well, yeah, to give you a sense, um, I have a number of family members who don't have family docs and, and I um, end up doing stuff for them that it makes, you know, that I'd rather not do. I, I don't, there's this sort of rule in medicine, you don't treat your, your relatives because right. you, you're not objective about them, you're biased. You, there's certain things you, you know, if I'm looking after my brother and he's got a problem P and I don't want to say, hey man, are you uh, having sex with hookers or something, right? Whereas I would, if it was just a patient i ask all those questions because i need to know and i don't know the person but with your family there's certain boundaries you don't cross and, and that right really, you know so but we how did you contract this particular disease because i really didn't want to know this as we're getting ready to sit down for christmas dinner thanks exactly. thanks a lot yeah yeah so there's good reasons for that kind of long that, that's been true in medicine as far back as i know the history of medicine that they they 
recommend. You want a, an objective distance between you and the patient. So you don't want to treat I'd, as your I'd be the guy to be like, well, it looks like it's going to require amputation. I just, that'd be my answer to every family. Yeah, pretty sure we're going to just go ahead and have to, to amputate. You can, so never, a headache. You can never go wrong. You can never go wrong yeah. with amputation. Right. So I don't think that this is boring because I th and anybody who's watching this might go, well, don't tell them that because it is kind of boring. But I think if you pay attention and you really, if you, if you weren't paying attention, please go back and listen to everything that we've been talking about up to this point, because this ties in very, just very importantly into where we're going now, which is you've been under attack. Yeah. since the beginning and just so you know much like unsafe where you and i connected through um we we say the coof because algorithms and stuff and so going back to basically february march of 2020 uh you've been pretty outspoken about coof pandemic coof mm -hmm. pandemic uh responses from both uh, government entities and the medical fields and um and have come out pretty hard on some of these things and this has put you under fire not just from from colleagues but from the government and 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 others yeah. what does that look like for you and, and and have you always been that way or was there something that happened that caused you to say okay i i need that something something's not right here yeah well you know maybe i'll give people a bit of a brief history myself because i didn't really tell you very much i like i i'm bo born and raised in nova scotia i'm from here you can tell by my act my accent funny way to talk um i uh, i would say i was actually uh, believe it or not i uh, my grandparents were, were about communists they were part of the communist movement when it was tied into workers rights back my grandfather was a coal miner um, and mm -hmm. a lot of coal mining and so i kind of come from that background my parents were actually left-leaning when i was young they kind of changed through the years as the left went nuts, but I, I came from a left-leaning family. But I always had a bit of a libertarian streak in me. Like the first thing uh, political I ever did was in med school. There was a one of our uh, professors had showed a uh, he was doing a lecture on urology, and he showed just to lighten it up. This is back. This shows you how all then. Remember the overhead projectors? He, oh yeah. He, yeah, to, to spice it up a bit, he had a, I think it was a, like a Herman cartoon on an overhead projector. It was a guy who had to go for his prostate exam, and the guy was saying, oh, i got to get my prostate exam. I'd rather pay alimony. Uh, I'd rather go make my alimony payments or something. That was the joke, and he put it up. And uh, I heard a week later that a couple of the very, very politically correct girls in my class had complained about this professor to the dean that it was uh, offensive, et cetera, et cetera, and that this professor was a, upset and thinking of quitting teaching for this reason because he was teaching vol voluntarily and i kind of stewed about it for a couple of days and i was a very quiet guy at the time i was afraid of public speaking and everything but anyway i put together a petition i stood up in class a couple of days later and i said look you know here's what happened in class i know a few of our class members felt this way but i just thought there's another side and, and if you weren't offended if you don't mind signing this petition and it was interesting because we had, I think we had 84 people in our class and uh, two people had complained and I think it was 81 signed my petition that, that, that said we weren't offended. And so that that's was tyranny. Cool. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> and that's, so that's kind of who I am. Uh, and if people want to look me up, if you look up, and my last name is M-I-L-B-U-R-N, but if you look up Chris Milburn and then Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, you'll, you'll hear that you'll see that I was actually kind of in trouble for being outspoken even before there was such thing as the coup for him. Um, I had written an article to the paper that, that kind of went viral, it got over a million views back in late 2019. It was about the issue of um, violent criminals in our emergency room system. Um, it, it, it's probably worth talking about because it'd be a great interest to you given your background. Uh, we had this situation here in Nova Scotia where there was a, a gentleman who was a, kind of a serial criminal. He had um, beaten his then girlfriend who was who was pregnant and had a restraining order against her and heard she was in the hospital to deliver the baby and went to the hospital quite intoxicated 
was aggressive with the security guards who were being told not to let him in. So the police were called and they had to take him to lock up, which they did. And he was spitting on them. So they put on this thing called a, a spit hood, which is like a spit uh, shield or spit hood. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it, it has the unfair reputation of being something that will smother people, but it's more like if anybody's ever worn a bug jacket. It's that's mesh. Really it's, you know, I've accidentally spit in my bug, bug jacket, forgetting I had it on, and it, it does keep the spit in, I can testify. So this guy got put in a spit hood, put in a cell. The jailers here are chronically understaffed. They had been, there had been talks going on with their union and management for 10 years saying, look, we're understaffed. We cannot look after all these people. I think there were two of them on to look after 32 people. And they were supposed to check this guy on a schedule, but they got behind schedule. And by the time they rechecked him, he had actually died of, uh, you know, I think he choked on his own vomit or whatever. And the, this will scare you when you hear this, but not only did they get in trouble, but they actually got sentenced to jail time for criminal negligence causing death. And I, I wrote a piece to the paper that just talked about the collapse of personal responsibility and how, uh, you know, we in the system, both me as a doctor, jailers, police, everybody in the system are working our, our, our level best to try to look after patients who are self-destructive and we can't always right. do them. We can only do our best. And when they die, it's not our fault all the time. And we shouldn't uh, be trying to pin people to the wall when this happens. And uh, I, I put it in the paper, it went viral, went all over North America, got all kinds of great feedback. And then the predictable attack from the left started, right? There were uh, professors of gender studies who started writing nasty pieces in the paper about me and how I hated, you know, I, ha I hated uh, people who were on drugs and all these weird things started to appear in the paper attacking me. And that was fine. And, you know, I kind of expect that. But then I got an official complaint that uh, to the medical licensing board, people who wanted me basically, you know, disbarred to be the, the lawyer word, but they wanted my license pulled because I had dared to say this. And so I, I was bound at that time. I was bound to confidentiality. I couldn't even talk about it. But behind the scenes, I was getting dragged through the mud. I had to go through this hearing process. The Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms here in Canada, JCCF.ca. Thank God they helped me because we we pay insurance to have lawyers if we do screw up, if a patient dies. And we, right. We, malpractice. But, right, and malpractice lawyers. But the malpractice lawyers would not help me. I had paid insurance for years, but their their response was, and this is a quote, we're not here to help you keep your free speech. We're here to help you keep your license. And if you're not willing to apologize, we're not going to help you. And I said, no, I'm not willing to apologize. So I had to go to the JCCF. And finally, everything worked its way through and I did keep my license, but I, I kind of won. I won the battle, but I, the, the war is not won because the final decision basically said, in the future, Dr. Milburn should be very careful, basically careful about what he says. And the, the implication was we're watching closely, right? So coming around to the coof, the coof hit. And, you know, I was probably like everybody else. The first news out of northern Italy, Bergamo, and then out of New York City, it was like, holy shit, is this the bubonic plague? I was pretty nervous. I actually suggested to my wife at one point, maybe she should go live at our cottage so she's not around me. Because if I bring a bug home and I kill her, I feel pretty bad and all this. But then, you know, the one thing I'll say, I have a background in hard sciences. So pretty quickly, I went from terrified to not quite so terrified to, okay, wait a minute, this is mostly killing old people. Okay, wait a minute, the average age of death is 82. Okay, wait a minute, it's not healthy people who are dying of this. And then not that I thought it was nothing, more that I thought the response after, after the first month or two, I thought the response was unjustified and, 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 and destructive. And that became my opinion. I had some, you know, kind of some minor flack for posting on social media and expressing my opinion. Some of the doctors who were more on the hysterical side got a, a little angry with me. And that, again, that's all fine. That's normal. That's what we should do. We should disagree and argue. And then in, in June of 2021, so this is a full year and some into the pandemic, I, I, I was a fairly regular guest on a kind of an opinion talk show on our local uh, radio. And I and they asked me to come on the show that week and they usually would give us the topics a day or two in advance so we kind of think about them. 
And I said, sure, I'll come on. And then, of course, I was, I was so busy that it was like midnight the night before I was on at 7.30 the next morning. Midnight, I looked at topics, and one of them was, oh, thanks. One of them was the COOF. And, uh, and what, you know, what do you think of the COOF response? And I thought, uh oh, this is, <laughs> is going to get me into trouble when I say my opinions. And I kind of thought about it, and I almost declined last minute to go on. And I thought, no, nah, you know what? I got to speak out. I'm frustrated. And I'm one of these people who believes that if you have a principle at heart and you believe what you say, then just say it, right? And so I went on. I said my piece the next day. The questions were things like, do you agree with vaccine passports? My answer, absolutely not. Do you agree with schools being shut down? My answer, absolutely not. And in the midst of it came up that whole idea that um, our democracy had basically been given over and we had de facto given the medical officer of health in our province the keys to drive the car wherever he wanted. And Gee, does that sound familiar to my friends here in the United States? Yes. Yeah. And even it's even worse in Canada. Uh, there's even less protections against our personal liberties. So so uh, what happened, we, we are still in, in Nova Scotia, we have been under an official state of emergency for two years now, um, almost almost two years. And the state of emergency means that our normal rights are suspended. The police have extraordinary powers to do various things. I can tell you lots of stories about what's happened with that. And, and they've just kept renewing the state of emergency, which has to be renewed every couple of weeks. And the, the minister responsible just keeps signing it, and signing it, and signing it. And that means the medical officer of health can micromanage our lives. Um, if, if you want to go visit your grandma, guess what? You better ask the medical officer of health. You want to go drive across the province and see somebody who's sick, you better ask the medical officer of health. If you want to cross a provincial border, better ask the medical officer of health. And then we got uh, into the whole thing about um, vaccine passports to go to a restaurant, to go to work, to, you know, we started firing healthcare employees who weren't vaccinated. All of the same problems as the U.S., except with less constitutionally guaranteed protections. So because Canada doesn't have they have a constitution, but it's not the same thing that the United States has, especially with the Bill of Rights, which, right. of course, we're finding out in the United States. That doesn't mean a lot to a lot of elected servants either. Um, but you have the, the Charter of Rights, mm -hmm. which reserves to the federal powers and even state powers the ability to override the Charter of Rights when they feel it's needed or necessary. Right. We are going for the